Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We have derived the mass conservation equation in the last class and look for two special cases. One is when the flow is incompressible. Okay. You see that the mass conservation equation or sometime we will call it continuity equation has become simply divergence of the velocity is 0. Okay. So, for incompressible flow or incompressible flow we have divergence of the velocity vector is 0 and for steady compressible flow For steady compressible flow, the continuity equation is simply divergence of rho u equal to 0. Okay. See for the incompressible flow, this divergence of u equal to 0, this holds even when the flow is unsteady, even when the flow is unsteady. That is in this case, this u can be function of time velocity at a point is a function of time. However, still the time derivative do not appear in the equation even when the flow is unsteady in case of incompressible flow that is because of that constant density case. In case of compressible flow the equation becomes simply a divergence only when the flow is steady otherwise that d rho d t term will be present. So, for compressible flow this u or this rho is not function of time, they are simply just function of spatial coordinates. <laughs> now, the spatial it is in this case that is in both these cases the mass conservation equation is expressed simply as a divergence. In one case it is divergence of the velocity field and in one case it is divergence of the velocity into the density. <laughs> now, let us assume that further another simplification that the flow is steady. If the sorry if the flow is two dimensional let us further assume that the flow is two dimensional then this divergence is basically sum of two derivative. So, for 2 d flow this then equation becomes for 2 d flows in case of incompressible flow the equation becomes what do we write u v w x y or u 1 u 2 x 1 x 2 either way. So, let us write this divergence of u is simply d u d x plus d v d y equal to 0. And in case of compressible flow, compressible steady flow, In this case, in both these cases, where this divergence can be expressed just simply by sum of two derivatives, it is quite easy to introduce a scalar function, a single scalar function, which will satisfy this equation. 
which will satisfy this equation. Say for the incompressible case, just taking an, as an example, if the in, for the incompressible case, define it is this way. define u as <coughs> and you see the equation is satisfied the divergence equation is satisfied see the simplification we had two unknown u and v we have replaced that by a single unknown psi. For compressible case, similarly we can define its little we have to take rho also along with it. See the difference between psi and psi in incompressible flow and psi in compressible flow. In case of compressible flow, the density is also within the definition, in case of incompressible flow, it is not. So, okay. Now, <coughs> henceforth, we will consider the in for our further discussion only this incompressible definition. But you can make everything whatever we are doing for incompressible, you can just do the same thing for compressible flow, wherever there is u, you replace it by rho u, wherever there is v, you replace it by rho v. Okay. So, everything will remain same only the, with that replacement. <coughs> this definition suggests that u for incompressible case now we are whatever we are do, writing here is for incompressible u dy minus v dx is an exact differential and let us that can be written as delta psi. If you want to make it for compressible again simply replace u by rho u v by rho v that will do nothing additional. Then integrating it between two points within the flow, integrating this equation between two points in the flow, say the two points we denote by O and P and the P is the point O x y, say point O and point P. along any path, along an arbitrary path, let us say this, along an arbitrary path O to P, the integration is carried out. <coughs> now, looking to this integration u, u d y minus b d x, can you say what does it imply? What is the meaning of that integration u d y minus b d x?
imagine a surface of unit depth that is a surface or imagine that this line O p is translated by a unit distance in the third direction the z direction. It will make a surface if this line O p is translated in the z direction by a unit distance it will trace a surface of unit width. Com think of that surface and then tell what is this what is the meaning of this integration. u d y you can think of u z d y where z is 1 z d y is then the area d z d y but d z is 1 fixed we have already fixed it. So, 1 into d y become the area of that surface which is normal to x direction. Okay. So, what is this first term of the integration? Yes, what is the meaning of this? normal component of the flow velocity into the surface area. What is that? We have already used that term huh? flux, the volume flux. Okay. So, this is the volume flux. The second term is the same. Yes, second term is again same. This also is d x into 1 that it is the area normal to this y component. So, this is the flux volume flux that is entering through that surface okay, entering in the generalized sense it might be leaving it might be entering. So, this integrand here or this complete integral is simply the volume flux that is entering through the surface traced by this line as it translates unit distance in the z direction. Okay. So, this is the volume flux across this we will call the volume flux across this line. So, this psi minus psi 0 gives the volume flux across this line. There is a sign convention usually associated with this volume flux. If the flux is counterclockwise with respect to p with respect to p then it is taken as positive. If this flux is um, counterclockwise with respect to point p then this flux is taken as positive. So, this is the volume flux just to make it short it is usually not called in this way that volume flux across the surface formed by translating this line unit without telling that much just call that volume flux across this line, where that across that line means that that this line is traced in the third direction by unit distance and the then the surface that is formed. So, this is volume flux across the line. Now, think about a pair of path two paths that completely make a closed curve think about these two paths let us say. Think about these two paths. This is one, 
this is 2 and assume that this is the region that is occupied by these two by this closed curve is completely filled with incompressible flow. Okay. That this region, this internal region is completely filled by incompressible flow. Then the net volume flux entering across these two path will sum to 0. That is what our mass conservation equation or continuity equation says that there will be no expand, no rate of extension, no dilatation, no change in volume. So, if this region is entirely filled with incompressible flow and we assume that there is no additional introduction of mass, we are not inserting mass from our volume from outside like we can have a tube put there and which is discharging there, not doing any sort of things that there is no volume creation. Then this is <coughs> by the requirement of the continuity equation that net volume flux entering this region must be 0. Okay. And what is the what does it mean then that this psi this function is a point function, its value depends only on the location of the point. Because see psi 0, psi minus psi 0 following this path and psi minus psi 0 following this path, they cancel each other. So, that means, the psi at this point is simply depends on this point itself as long as the path enclosing only incompressible flow region. Okay. If the enclosed region is filled with incompressible flow, then this psi has a single value at the point p or it dip, this is a point function. <coughs> so, we'll, uh, this net volume flux is 0 And hence, this gives that <coughs> psi is a point function, and then the difference between the psi between two points is simply the value of psi between two points is yes? like psi p minus psi o that is the way we want. We need only the value of psi at p and at o it is independent of the path that it follows whatever path it may take the difference will remain the same. Of course, provided the path is one of two paths which completely encloses incompressible flow region, otherwise not, otherwise not. <coughs> now then, since the difference of psi between two points
is given by that integral, what, what will be the difference of psi when the two points lie on a streamline? Or what will be the value of psi on a streamline? See, we know the streamline is a line to which the velocity is tangential. Okay. So, what will be the flux across a streamline? 0, because the flow velocity is always tangential to the streamline. So, there is no flux crossing any streamline. So, that means that integrand for the streamline is 0. If that point O to p lies on a streamline, then the integrand is 0. And what does it mean? Psi p is so same as psi 0 o, meaning that the function psi is constant on a streamline. Okay. So, I on a streamline is constant. <laughs> and following this, this function psi has a special name, it is usually called the stream function. The psi function psi is called a stream function. In this case of incompressible flow, this is a function of position and as well as time. So, psi is basically for incompressible flow case psi x y t, it is a function of position and time. <coughs> of course, if the flow is steady, then it is not dependent on t. <coughs> One thing you must remember that about the function psi, the way we defined this psi and the volume flux we mentioned, it is quite clear that the psi is basically a many valued function, it is not a single valued function. As long as the region is completely occupied by incompressible flow, psi behaves like a single single valued function. However, if the region encloses some internal boundary in which there is somehow a creation of volume, a creation of volume may be like say you have a flow region in which you are introducing some tube which is discharging some fluid there or also a very simple case remember that okay, your fluid region is water and think there are some air bubble within it. Then as the air bubble expands or contracts, your incompressible flow region or the water region changes, the volume of the water region changes. Okay. So, in, the, in that type of situation, where there is some interior boundary in which the volume of the total incompressible fluid is, can change. Then this function is no longer a single valued function. If this rate of discharge or if this rate of increase is m, then every round you make the value of the stream function will increase by m. So, if you make 2 round it will increase by 2 m, if you make 3 round it will increase by 3 m and so on. So, 
However, if that type of situation is not there, there is no internal boundary or then the function is single valued, but whenever there is an internal boundary, then the function is not single valued. We will later on come back to it and we will see that this needs some special treatment in some of our problems that we will be handling. <coughs> now, the stream function and the velocity component in terms of it, we have defined for our standard Cartesian system. For other system also you can define it. See one very useful is the so called polar coordinate r theta coordinate system. Okay. For r theta coordinate system, if you define again, you can define that volume flux exactly in the same manner and the velocity components, let us say if you call u r in polar coordinates. Okay, let us write u r u theta at the standard notation, it is 1 by r You can remember you see that in one case the sign is changing, but it is easy to remember in this way that if you differentiate the stream function by in any direction, you will get the velocity in the direction which is 90 degree clockwise. If you differentiate it any direction, you will get the velocity component in the 90 degree clockwise direction. That is all. <laughs> you can check it with this that in both cases that is what it is. If you differentiate it with respect to y, you get the velocity with respect to x which is 90 degree to the clockwise. If you differentiate it with respect to x, you get the velocity in the negative y direction which is again 90 degree clockwise with respect to x. <laughs> so, differentiate by any direction you get the velocity in the 90 degree clockwise direction. <coughs> this stream function has another interpretation. If the velocity is expressed as curl of a vector potential, which can always be done, which can always be done, if the velocity is expressed as curl of a vector potential, then the stream function is the third component of that vector potential. That is, if you define sorry, that will be then the stream function is third component is <coughs> of this vector potential. <coughs> this B z we are meaning that third third component of the vector potential z component. Also look back to the definition of the streamline, the mathematical expression for stream function, streamline. We did it last class d x by u equal to d y by v equal to d w by z sorry d z by w. 
forget that third component for the two two dimensional case it is d x by u equal to d y by v and you see that that is immediately get that volume flux is 0 u d y minus v d x equal to 0. So, from the definition of the stream function also we can come to it u d y minus v d x is 0 on a streamline. <coughs> Any other component like say if we consider an axisymmetric case or uh, symmetric case in spherical coordinate system again we can write what are the two components of velocity and we will do that whenever we come across that type of situation. <coughs> and now let us look to something little different the relative velocity what exactly the relative velocity leads to in case of fluid motion. So, relative velocity near a point. Let us say we have a point which is denoted by the position vector x and of course, at time t this is the point p <coughs> and let us say at this point the velocity is u Let us say a neighboring point, a neighboring point which position vector is x plus r. Instead of writing any delta x, we are writing r. The distance between two point is r, which is of course very small. Okay. And again at the same time only, that is the relative velocity at same instant, simultaneous relative velocity we are not finding the difference in velocity at two different instants at one point it is at one point of time we are seeing what is the difference between the velocity at two neighboring point and uh, again the velocity will be function of sorry Now, again introducing that vector notation, what is the difference between these two? Or let us say write again this notation. Okay. What will be the difference of this? See, this can be obtained by a Taylor series expansion of this. Okay. This can be obtained as a Taylor series expansion of this. So, this equal to this plus something. So, what is that something? this is the first term of that Taylor series, this equal to this plus this, then plus of course, r j square into second derivative of this and so on. But 
assuming that r j is small to the first order to the first order this is what is required plus higher order terms and plus higher order terms which involves square of r j d 2 d 2 u y d x j 2 okay, and so on. So, to first order of accuracy we can have only this term. Okay. So, this difference we will call it now delta u. So, the delta u between these two points delta u i is simply r j d u y d x j to first order to first order accuracy. Then look to this term d u y d x j what it is. See it has 9 component d u 1 d x 1 d u 2 d x 2 d u 1 d x 3 and so on is not it this d u y d x j if we expand it it is So, d u y d x j is the velocity gradient tensor, it is a tensor, it has 9 component. <coughs> gradient of component 1 along direction 1, along direction 2, along direction 3 gradient of component 2 along direction 1, along direction 2, along direction 3. You need 2 quantity to specify it. Gradient of which component and in which gradient in which direction, which component and which gradient in which direction. So, these 2 quantities are to be specified. So, this is a tensor <laughs> velocity gradient tensor. Now, it is a standard rule in matrix that any matrix you can write it as sum of one symmetric and one anti symmetric matrix. If you have any square matrix you can write it as sum of one symmetric matrix and one anti symmetric matrix that is always true. You see this is how that can be done this d u i d x j can simply be written as half d u y d x j plus d u j d x i plus half d u y d x j minus d u j d x i. And you see this first part is a symmetric matrix the second part is anti symmetric. So, that expression for the difference in velocity delta u i can be written as
we will call this symmetric part as E i j. R j E i j R j z i j. Where the symmetric part we are calling as E i j and the anti symmetric part we are calling as z i j. And this two part of the velocity difference or contribu two contributions, one by the symmetric tensor, one by the anti symmetric tensor, we will just call it say symmetric contribution and the anti symmetric contribution because you would like to see uh, the nature of each contribution separately. <coughs> now, consider first this R j E i j, what is the contribution to this velocity or what is the nature of this contribution. To understand this contribution, let us say that our axis system is such that just take it that our axis system is such that it coincides with the principal axis of E i j. Even if it is not, we can orient our axis system so that it coincides with the principal axis of E i j. We can do it. then of course, there will be no up diagonal term. We are doing it so that we have less number of terms and it is easier to interpret. It is easier to interpret the meaning that is the only purpose why, why we want to consider it that consider the principal axis of E i j or let us say our axis system is represented by that. Then we have and let us say that component that coordinate system just to have a difference are denoted by prime. Okay. That is instead of E i j we will call it E i j prime, when it is the principal system. And <coughs> we will have then only three component, only three component no up diagonal terms and this delta u i the three component are in a very simple form okay. and delta u 1 will be delta u 1 s will be simply r 1 prime E 1 1 prime. This prime is that we are now having the principal system. Okay. Similarly, delta U 2 will be 
r2 prime e22 prime and delta u 3s will also be r3 prime e33 prime that's all in a general case of course these are not only one term there will be other terms also in this case delta u1 will be r1 e11 plus r2 e12 plus r3 e13 delta u1 will be r1 e12 e11 plus r2 e12 plus r3 e13 but now we have only one term r1 prime e11 prime also since this tensor is also have the same invariant that is e i i is same as e i i prime from tensor invariant e i i prime that is e 1 1 prime plus e 2 2 prime plus e 3 3 prime is same as e 1 1 plus e 2 2 plus e 3 3 that is equal to e i i. <coughs> we have already seen what it is. You can write this explicitly what is e 1 1 or e 1 1 prime look to that expression what is e 1 1 prime or e 1 1 e 1 1 is simply d u 1 d x 1 look to the definition of e i e j e 1 1 is d u 1 d x 1 so this means d u 1 d x 1 plus d u 2 d x 2 plus d u 3 d x 3 this u 1 u 2 u 3 you can replace them u v w u x 1 x 2 x 3 you can write them x y z what is this divergence of u ok this is his divergence of u divergence of u and which also we have seen is the same as the rate of dilatation or rate of expansion. So, this is rate of expansion or rate of dilatation which we have already seen. So, now look to only one component or imagine the situation just, just an imagination I am not saying that this can happen that only e 1 1 prime is non, non zero e 2 2 prime e 3 3 prime they are 0. Then you have only delta u 1 which is given as r 1 e 1 1 prime. Okay. So, this velocity is simply proportional to the rate of expansion in the same direction. So, each term here represent a motion which, re, which is given by the rate of expansion in the same direction. Then think about now a say sphere, think about now a sphere and let us say that this motion is given to or this sphere has this motion. The center of the sphere is at x and it circumference is at the all those points x r at x plus r. Now, what will happen to this sphere? that in each principal direction or in each orthogonal direction it will move by a distance r 1 e 1. The velocity will be there as r 1 e 1 in each direction. So, in every three major di diameter direction if you take it each direction is being extended by e 1 1 prime e 2 2 prime or e 3 3 prime or let us call it a b c is being extended at the rate of a b c. Or 
obviously it will no longer remain a sphere it will become an ellipsoid so this contribution to the motion is such that it will try to make a sphere with which will be an ellipsoid the element which are on the principal axis they will not experience any rotation they will not experience any rotation but simply experience a stretching in the same direction the other line elements which are not along this direction they will experience both a stretching as well as a rotation but remember this rotation is such that it is consistent with the stretching along the principal direction this contribution to the relative motion or obviously the motion is called as straining motion now look for the special case if the flow is incompressible we know that this is zero this divergence of u is zero so in case of incompressible flow this motion represent a pure straining motion such that the volume do not change without change in volume a pure straining motion without change in volume for incompressible flow that is the meaning of the term that delta u s a pure straining motion without change in volume of course if the flow is not incompressible then there will be change in <coughs> volume but in that case again this motion can be decomposed into two part one is an isotropic expansion that is ex equal expansion in all equal direction given by one third of e i i in all equal in all direction an isotropic expansion and another straining motion without change in volume so this delta us represent a pure straining motion without change in volume if the flow is incompressible flow if the flow is not incompressible then delta us represent an isotropic expansion plus a pure straining motion without change in volume so to summarize let's write that this delta uis represents a pure straining motion without change in volume plus oh sorry for income this is only for income for incompressible flow only this much and for compressible flow an isotropic expansion that is equal expansion in all direction now let's come to the second contribution delta uia the antisymmetric contribution what is the meaning of that antisymmetric contribution what it is first of all see that delta ua by definition the way we have defined that xi ij it has 
only three non-zero component. Of course, all diagonal elements are zero. It has only of diagonal elements. That is what is the anti-symmetric tensor means. That all diagonal elements are zero, which you can see dui dxj minus duj dxi. So the diagonal elements will get cancelled. <coughs> Amongst the up diagonal elements, you see that one is opposite the other. J one two and J two one. They have same magnitude but opposite sign. So basically, they have three independent value. J i j has three independent components. So the J i j, even though it is tensor, it behaves like a vector. Sometimes called a pseudo vector or pseudo tensor. And can be written as j i j can be written as epsilon i j k omega k. So that j one two and j two one they become opposite sign, same value with opposite sign. So I think we have to stop here. J i j only three independent components We will stop here today, <coughs> but you won't be able to complete it today. So we'll continue it. We'll continue it next class. 